evening everyone uh, while the host will keep on admitting the participants maybe in order to ensure that we have more time for the discussion maybe we can start uh, with the session so this is on the recent norms which were rolled out by uh, rbi on overseas investments and uh, this is a discussion to understand an overview of the new regime as well as uh, get a feel from you as to what are the practical concerns you think uh, you know would likely to face by the companies and we also have with us uh, a senior professional from uh, ad bank idfc first whom i will be introducing shortly who will be mainly dealing with the with the changes with the practical parts and uh, what is it that the companies need to be mindful about so i'll be dealing with the regulatory overview while we have a person from the ad bank who will be dealing with the practical aspects okay so i'll just get started so we intend to discuss what is the scope and applicability of these provisions uh, what are what all are what all is uh, is there in the rules regulations directions then some new concepts some practical issues which are arising from the definitions uh, then what are the limits are there any change in the limits for making odi or for making the portfolio investments and what are the approval requirements on the reporting requirements etc uh, i'll maybe pass on to the ad bank who would be dealing with it, with this in more detail the the regime relating to late submission fee and what are the consequences of delayed reporting or non filing etc maybe uh, mr satish would be the better person to deal with it so in terms of the scope and applicability we all understand that these provisions are now uh, rolled out for the first time we had the provisions since 2004 uh governing investments in joint ventures or wos outside india and last year there were draft rules rolled out where in the intent of rbi was to follow a similar uh, practice as it did in case of foreign direct investments wherein there was a segregation of non debt instruments and debt instruments and the norms relating to the non debt instruments the power was given to central government to frame the rules and in relation to the debt instruments the power remained with rbi to frame the regulations and that is how the basic distinction you will find even in overseas investment rules and regulations so when i say rules it has been framed by the central government through the ministry of finance and then we have the overseas investment regulations which have been framed by the reserve bank of india so although the rules have been framed by the ministry but it will be continued to be administered by reserve bank and then we also have a directions it is not the master directions it's a directions to the ad bank which uh which collates kind of key points key compliance requirements under the rules and the regulations and it also have certain practical notes and examples which the rbi has given to the ad bank so definitely that is also something which the companies will have to uh look upon in addition to seeing the rules and the regulations now the old regulations that is transfer or issue of any foreign security regulations 2004 stand superseded with effect from august 22 2022 and also the the power to acquire immobile property outside india has also moved under the central government regime and therefore those regulations of 2015 also stand superseded as that part has now been combined in the overseas investment rules so this is the construct of the scope and applicability they have also prescribed in which all cases this will not be applicable so any investments which is made outside india by financial institutions as defined under the ifsc act investments made by them in ifsc is not governed by these provisions uh, then acquisition or investment out of the funds in the resident foreign currency account or out of the funds in foreign currency held by persons employed in india for more than 3 years so this is not a new exclusion it was already there and now it has been expressly stated in the rules investments in foreign securities or immobile property when it was acquired when the person was a person resident outside india this also remains the same as earlier now if we look at the construct of the rules regulations and directions just to have a helicopter view so the rules are divided into 20 21 rules and five schedules uh, and if you see what is there in the rules vis a vis what is given in the regulations you would understand that 
uh, more in terms of the manner of making ODI, manner of making overseas uh, portfolio investments, then in what manner, what are the prohibited sectors, permitted sectors, how the approval has to be sought, uh, what are the limits for the financial commitment, etc. Everything comes from the rules. And if we look at the regulations, there are total 12 regulations, and that mainly deals with the firstly relating to the debt instruments and the non-fund based related requirements. So the norms relating to investment in debt instruments, norms relating to giving of guarantee, uh, be it corporate guarantee, performance guarantee, giving of pledge or creation of charge. So all these practical or operational part is dealt by the Reserve Bank in the regulations. Reporting requirements, uh, what happens if there is a delay, what will be the late submission fee, etc. All of this is dealt in the regulations. And then we have the directions which are divided into four parts, wherein there are general provisions as to who all are eligible to make overseas investment. Then there are specific provisions on the conditions for making overseas investments. And um, thereafter we have the last part, which provides the operational instructions to the AD banks. Under the definitions, while well, they have reproduced the definitions from the rules, but there are also certain explanatory notes, certain examples, which, are, which will be very useful in understanding the intent of the uh, regulator. Now, firstly, coming to the concept of foreign entity, we all understand that we had the concept of joint venture in WOS under the earlier regime, and now that stands substituted with the term foreign entity. And the definition also remains the same that foreign entity means an entity which is formed or registered or incorporated outside India. And when I say outside India, it can be in IFSC as well. It has to be with a limited liability. So the structure should be such where the liability of the person resident in India is limited. And if it is in, uh, it is in the strategic sector, if the core activity of the entity is in the strategic sector, in those cases, it can be in the form of an unincorporated entity as well. So as a general rule, the foreign entity has to be uh, an entity with limited liability. But if it is in, un, uh, in a strategic sector, in those cases, it can be incorporated. I mean, it can be an unincorporated entity as well. Again, this concept of unincorporated entity was there under the earlier regime, uh, wherein the companies in the oil and natural gas sectors and minerals, etc., were required to form such partnerships. But now they have defined the term strategic sector. Startups are also included uh, in the definition of the strategic sector. And accordingly, they have let down the rules uh, for entities that are incorporating uh, in strategic sector. Second condition is that they should be engaged in bona fide business activity. Again, we understand this is also not a new requirement. We had that in the earlier regime as well. And what is a bona fide activity is any business activity which is permitted under any law in force in India or under the in the host country. And this, this condition of the foreign entity being with a limited liability and engaged in bona fide business activity also applies equally to the subsidiary and the step down subsidiary of such foreign entity. So foreign entity is the concept under the new regime, substituting the JV and WS concept under the old regime. Additionally, uh, it has been expressly provided which are the prohibited sectors. So real estate, banking were anyways prohibited but now they have also included gambling and they have included dealing with financial products linked with INR. So derivative products are also uh, included expressly in the prohibited sector. Now talking about uh, overseas direct investment. Just a moment. Yes. So overseas direct investment the term which was used under the earlier regime was direct investment outside India. So now we have a term of overseas direct investment. Then we have overseas portfolio investment. We have the term of financial commitment, which we already had under the earlier regime and combine all of that, we have the overseas investment. If you recall, it's you have similar concept under FDI where you have foreign direct investment, foreign portfolio investment, and I combine to get my total foreign investment. Now, various modes, uh, even the classification, how do you classify an OPI versus an ODI? You would also find similarity with the norms for foreign investment in India. For example, in case of an unlisted foreign entity, any acquisition or any stake that you hold in the equity capital 
whether by way of acquisition or by way of subscription to the MOA, it will be regarded or identified as an overseas direct investment. But when it comes to a listed foreign entity, when I say listed foreign entity would mean uh, an equity listed foreign entity, in those cases, the threshold will be whether I'm holding 10% or more of the paid up equity capital. Only in those cases, the investment will classify as an overseas direct investment. Otherwise, the investment will classify as an overseas portfolio investment. However, if I'm holding less than 10%, but there is an element of control, which is exercised by the resident over the foreign entity, then irrespective of that holding, it will get classified as an overseas direct investment. Once an investment is classified as an ODI, even if subsequently it falls below the threshold, it will continue to be regarded as ODI. Same concept you would have under FDI as well uh, in the context of investments in equity listed Indian entities. Now the various modes in which one would make overseas direct investment would be uh, pursuant to the incorporation wherein you are subscribing to the MOA or you are purchasing the equity capital. It could be acquisition through the tender or bidding process. Then there may be further investment or further acquisition person to the rights issue or allotment of bonus shares. Thereafter, if there are any amount which is due to be recovered from the foreign entity and, and within the time frame which is permitted under the, under the Indian FEMA norms, uh, you can have it, uh, you can capitalize the amount due and result in, in the ODI. However, the condition is that it should be done within the time period specified for realization because that cannot be the option where there is a non-recovery and you try to just convert it into the equity share. So therefore the time frame for whatever is the time frame for realization and remittance in India, within that time frame, you can take the call to capitalize the amount due to the Indian entity from the foreign entity. There could be by way of swap of securities. It could be also because of any kind of restructuring where there is merger amalgamation or any scheme of arrangement. Now, ODI in the financial service activity, we understand that under the current regime, only an entity which was engaged in financial sector could only uh, have JV or WOS that was also supposed to be engaged in financial service activity and the approval of the regulator from both sides was a prerequisite. Now there has been a change in the new regime wherein they have permitted investment in financial service activity by a foreign entity, which is uh, by an Indian entity, which is engaged in financial service activity, as well as by an Indian entity, which is not engaged in financial service activity. And if you look at the conditions, you would realize that it is far more easier for an entity, which is not into financial service sector in India to establish maybe or set up uh, uh, an entity, a foreign entity engaged in that activity. Maybe the AD bank also would like to uh, deliberate on this as to what was the thought process or what was the intent in liberalizing this to such an extent. So as we see that if an Indian entity is engaged in a financial service activity, when I say financial service activity, which means if that activity is carried out in India, it will require registration with some financial sector regulators. So if it's an insurance activity or if it's a banking activity or if it's a non-banking activity, it will require registration with the respective financial sector regulator. So that is the meaning of financial sector activities. So if the Indian entity is into that activity and if it has posted profits during last three financial years, and it has approval from its own regulator and also approval of the respective regulator of the host country in uh, wherein you intend to enter into the financial service activity. In those cases, you can set up. There is also an exemption that only because of the COVID impact if during 2021 and 21, 22, the company could not post profits, then those two years may not be considered while uh, while determining the track record of the three years. So that is again a carve out which has been provided specifically for considering the COVID impact. Now coming to, uh, if you're if you're opening this in an IFSC, there is even an interesting situation because it says that in case of investment in IFSC, the financial sector authority has to decide within 45 days from the date of receipt of complete application. And if not, it will be regarded as deemed approved. Uh, I'm not sure if that is the case anywhere 
in India or abroad, wherein if I make an application for a financial sector activity and if it is not granted, we take it as deemed approved. So this is again a carve out which is quite interesting. If an Indian entity is not engaged in financial sector activity, so we, we may have a manufacturing entity or any other entity which is into a non-financial sector, same condition if it has posted profits in the preceding three financial years, out of which due to COVID impact, they have a carve out for two years. In those cases, they can engage in FSA activity except for banking. In case of insurance, they have specifically given a condition that the insurance activity should be supporting their core activity, which is undertaken by the Indian entity. So for example, in case of health insurance, where the foreign entity is engaged, say in medical or health segment, then that becomes supporting to the core activity. Similarly, if the entity is into manufacturing of motor vehicles, et cetera, then the general insurance activity may be regarded as a supporting activity. So they have permitted that as well. Additionally, if the Indian entity is a non-bank or a banking institution, then the respective provisions of RBI in India would also be required to be compliant. So this is some, in a way, quite liberalized as compared to the position under the earlier regime, wherein uh, it was not permitted, a, a non-financial entity was not permitted to take up activities in the financial uh, services. Now, coming to overseas portfolio investment, this is something which is apart from ODI and therefore the limits also, as we discussed, you will understand is in addition to what is available for the purpose of direct investment. So overseas portfolio investment could be by way of investment in the foreign securities. And what has been excluded is the unlisted debt instruments. So you cannot be investing in unlisted debt instruments. Again, what is debt instrument? What is non-debt instrument has been again laid down in the rules. Uh, so debt instrument would comprise of the corporate bonds, borrowing by the firms through loans, government bonds, etc. And the meaning of non-debt instrument is pretty much similar to what we have uh, in the non-debt instrument rules for FDI. So it's the same uh, definition which has been given in the OI rules as well. It includes, uh, it excludes the investment in security issued by person resident in India. So obviously because that's not an ODI, except where uh, you make an investment in IFSC because IFSC would be regarded as a, as a foreign jurisdiction and therefore those investments will be still counted oh. eligible for the purpose of overseas portfolio investment. Now, once you have made You are on mute, Vinita, you are on mute. Hello. Yeah, I'm audible. Yes. 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 Okay. So in case of OPI as well, the, the underlying principle remains same that once it is an overseas portfolio investment for a listed entity, it will continue to remain uh, like that even after delisting until you have made some further investments. Now it also covers or it also expresses wherein the investments are made in any pooled investment vehicle or investment funds, it has specified that uh, the sponsor contribution will be considered as overseas portfolio investment. And in jurisdictions other than IFSC, listed Indian companies and resident individuals are permitted. So if you're talking about IFSC, even unlisted entities can make such investment. But when I'm talking about other than IFSC, then the permission is only for listed Indian companies and resident individuals to invest in units of regulated investment funds. When I say regulated, because they have to be registered and regulated by the respective financial sector authority uh, in the host jurisdiction. Any investment which is made by the mutual funds or the venture capital funds or AIFs in India would be regarded as overseas portfolio investment. This is again not a new thing because we know there was a general permission along with certain limits under the earlier regime when even the listed entities and these entities were eligible to make portfolio investments outside. And now it has been properly classified uh, under OPI. So we have ODI and OPI. Now, manner of making overseas portfolio investment, you have a limit of 50% of the network as on the last date of your audited balance sheet. So this is in addition to the 400% of network that we have for the regular financial commitment. This is an additional limit that companies would be having. 
and this was the same similar limit was there under the earlier regime as well when it comes to resident individuals the limit will be the uh, uh, limit under the liberalized remittance scheme of 250000 usd per financial year now how will you make the overseas portfolio investment there is not much restriction for a listed entity as compared to an unlisted indian company wherever i'm referring the term listed unlisted it has been defined that the uh, the definition is linked with the equity listing so if it's an equity listed foreign entity we will regard it as a listed foreign entity similarly an equity listed indian entity will be regarded likewise so when i say unlisted it would mean debt listed or non equity listed entities there are limited avenues of making uh, overseas portfolio investments it could be by way of acquisition of rights issue or there is some bonus issue or the similar condition wherein you are capitalizing the amount which is due from the foreign entity provided the amount is good and within the time which is provided under fema to uh, realize the said amounts by way of swap of securities or pursuant to scheme of arrangement so they have given expressly which are those cases in which an unlisted indian company can make overseas portfolio investment now coming to the concept of financial commitment financial commitment again is a broader term which would comprise of odi then whatever debt which is not forming part of opi so it doesn't mean that if i'm not falling within the construct of opi there cannot be any investment that can be made it can be made but it will be counted towards your financial commitment so debt uh, other than opi becomes that is also one of the component of your financial commitment so these are fund based commitment where there is an actual remittance of money and then you have non fund based facilities which could be in the nature of corporate guarantee bank guarantee performance guarantee etc these are also forming part of the financial commitment negative pledge or a negative lien or merely a non disposal undertaking that the company would have given would not be considered as financial commitment uh, this is again expressly provided now conditions for making financial commitment which are either by way of debt or by way of non fund based this becomes very important uh, and i'll explain why so earlier we just had a simple list of what all is comprised in the definition of financial commitment wherein we had direct investment outside india and then 100% of corporate guarantee 50% of performance guarantee so likewise we had a list and there was an overall limit of 400% of the net worth of that entity now they have split into fund based and non fund based and not that every indian company would be eligible to give that non fund based facility because there are three conditions firstly the indian entity should be eligible to make odi secondly the they have made odi so it cannot be that there is no direct investment made and it is only intending to provide a non fund based facility that is again not permitted so the entity should be eligible it should have made overseas direct investment and the indian entity should have acquired control over the foreign entity these are the three conditions if these all of these are satisfied then the indian entity would be eligible to extend debt or extend non fund based commitment to the overseas entity and as i discussed and when you talk about overseas investment as a whole we are combining all the modes of making the overseas investment either by way of a financial commitment or by way of a portfolio investment so your overseas investment will be financial commitment plus the overseas portfolio investment now coming to a very important concept of control one would wonder that why is it so important because it's that concept is there under companies act under takeover norms and competition law and several other places and on a first reading the the definition also seems quite similar to what we have under the companies act with the only difference that when it talks about voting agreements there is a reference made to 10% or more of the voting rights now this has resulted in all confusion because there are two set of interpretation one set of interpretation says that the moment i have 10% or more voting rights in my kitty then i am said to be controlling that entity now we all understand if that is the interpretation uh, you know the life our lives will be very much difficult because if we look at the definition of control it says in what manner does an entity exercise control over the other entity first they have the right to appoint majority of directors so the composition of board is controlled by the indian entity and second you control the management or the policy decisions so these are the two means uh, that reflects or that demonstrates that there is an exercise of control 
the manner in which this would be achieved there would be several uh, several manner in which you would achieve it so it could be by virtue of your shareholding it could be by virtue of the management rights shareholders agreement voting agreements or in any other manner so the five things that are listed in the definition are technically the mode in which you will you will reach the end and the end result would be that there is a right to appoint majority of directors or there is a right to control the management or policy decisions so this was the understanding even under companies that where we have a similar definition but merely because of inclusion of this 10% or more of voting rights it has resulted in a confusion that whether it means uh, merely by virtue of holding 10% or more of voting rights i am able to exercise control or the end result or the test remains same that irrespective of what is my holding the test is whether i am able to uh, appoint majority of directors on the board or i'm able to control the management or policy decisions and why this is so critical because if you have control if there is a if there is an establishment of control only then you will be able to lend or invest in the debt or undertake the non fund based commitment secondly it is also relevant when i'm talking about the subsidiary or the step down subsidiary because the definition says what is a step down subsidiary or subsidiary of a foreign entity in which the foreign entity exercises control now if we take the interpretation that a foreign entity merely by virtue of holding 10% or more in the downstream entity exercises control and the entity becomes my step down subsidiary then it will be a different ball game altogether it also impacts the modes of investment by resident individuals so therefore clarity is needed on this concept of control as to what is the intent why that 10% threshold whether my end result remains the same or there is some new angle to it maybe uh, we'll also request satish ji to deliberate on this if you know is aware about the thought process of rbi that went into this given as it is if this is the interpretation where we are saying that 10% or more is results in control it will be a very tough time for the companies to comply with these requirement so if we look at a broad overview of the manner in which you would make the overseas investment it could be by way of financial commitment wherein there is odi or there is debt other than opi or you make through the overseas portfolio investments and there are various modes available so that it gives a broad overview of the various manner in which you can do the overseas investment now quickly talking about the limits on the financial commitment the limits remain the same we have 400% of net worth and wherein if there is a financial commitment exceeding 1 billion usd or equivalent in a financial year i will require a prior approval of rbi so both the conditions remain same as under the present regime and net worth definition has been now linked with companies act there is also an exemption to certain psus that are engaged in strategic sectors uh, to undertake the financial commitment even beyond the prescribed limits now exclusion from the computation of limit what all amounts will i exclude while computing this financial commitment so one is where there is a capitalization of retained earnings or where there is a bonus issue that that component will not form part of my financial commitment so if there is a bonus issue that it will not block my limit of financial commitment but what is more important is the other change which was not there earlier so earlier if you recall any amount which i raise from or use from my export earners foreign currency eefc account or out of adr gdr proceeds or ecb proceeds would not form part of the financial commitment but now they have said that whatever you must have raised or done before the notification that's fine but any utilization of the balances in the efc account or any utilization out of the proceeds of adr or gdr after august 22nd will now form part of the financial commitment so in a way we cannot say it's liberalized your limit has actually reduced because the sources which were additionally available now will form part of the financial commitment there is also a way of tagging uh, in tagging the financial commitment in case of non fund based facility because there is not you don't have an immediate remittance of money so they have stated that in cases of guarantees you have instances where some group company either your holding or your subsidiary or a promoter group company would extend a guarantee so in those cases whose financial commitment you know will will that get tagged to so that is again provided in the regulations uh, because this forms part of the 
this comes under the domain of RBI. Therefore, all of this has been provided in the OI regulations, wherein they've said that if the group company is eligible to make ODI, it will be counted towards their own financial commitment limit. But if a resident promoter is extending, in that case, it will be clubbed with the financial commitment limit of the Indian entity. And where you have joined and several you know, guarantee which is given jointly and severally by the Indian entities. In that case, that amount 100% will be tagged or linked with respective Indian entities. Now, there are certain other conditions as well in relation to the financial commitment that when you're giving by way of debt and when it is in the form of a loan, it has to be backed by a loan agreement and your rate of interest should be charged on an arm's length basis. If, if in case there is a guarantee being given, it cannot be open-ended. And the moment the guarantee is invoked, it shall cease to be part of the non-fund based commitment. Uh, for performance guarantee, 50% of the amount will be counted towards your FC limit. And that is something that was there in the existing or the erstwhile regime as well. So there is nothing new except for the part that my loan agreements, uh, there has to be loan agreements and my rate of interest should be on an arm's length basis. Uh, this is just a summary which is given in the directions for the pledge. And if you would see that wherever I'm creating a charge or I'm giving pledge uh, for the purpose of Indian entity, for the purpose of commitments or facilities which are availed by the Indian entity, it will not impact my financial commitment. The moment I'm raising funds or giving security or creating a pledge in order to secure the fundraising which will be utilized by my uh, subsidiary or the foreign entity, in that case, that amount will get tagged towards the financial commitment limit. So the distinction is very clear because if I'm simply raising for my own use, it will not impact the financial commitment, but where it is being raised for the purpose of my foreign entity investment made abroad, you are indirectly funding by providing the security and therefore the value of security which you have provided becomes a part of the financial commitment. Now, uh, I'll come to this very important part and I'm, I'm sure Satish Ji would also like to deal with this in detail and that is I think one of the most important reasons why several of you also must have enrolled for this discussion. So ODI FDI structure if we if I give a background it, it was to deal with the round tripping that the money should not go from India you have a JV or WS outside India and then the same money is being routed by way of FDI in, in the country and in the past also there were compounding orders, which, which gave the rationale that this is not a bona fide business activity, which is being done by the entity outside India. And therefore, a penalty was imposed on those entities. Thereafter, RBI also rolled out in the FAQs. Uh, firstly, it stated there is an absolute prohibition. You cannot invest in any entity which has investment in India or vice versa that once you have made investment overseas, such entities should not be uh, supplying FDI in the in the country. So there was an absolute prohibition and this came by way of an FAQ. There was no amendment notification or amendment regulation. And thereafter it went under the approval route wherein RBI said that because the intent was not to stifle genuine business transactions, it stated that it would be under the approval route wherein RBI would evaluate on the merit basis. So this was the background. Thereafter in 2019, uh, when Ministry of Commerce set up this high level advisory committee, they also addressed this, this situation and said that this is not helping. This is actually uh, stifling the legitimate purpose for which the company would have this structure. And it also gives certain thresholds that within this threshold, if, if it is falling, then this structure should be permitted. Thereafter, when we had the draft rules, it stated that if the intent is to, uh, if the intent is tax evasion or tax avoidance, only in those cases, this structure will be prohibited. Otherwise, there won't be any prohibition on the structure. So this is what the background, what was there under the existing regime and what we had uh, in, the, in the draft notes. But thereafter, what came in the present regime is linkage with the layers of subsidiary. So where we were talking about round tripping of money, somewhere it has been now linked with the the whole network or the opacity which is created because of the layers and now it says that you may have an fdi odi structures provided there is it does not result in more than two layer of subsidiary and this is where it has resulted a pain point for for everyone because firstly what is the layer the meaning of subsidiary is it linked with companies that where i'm simply controlling the composition or holding 
more than half of the voting power or is it in accordance with the meaning of control under oi rules which says that 10% of voting rights may result in control so if you understand various scenarios wherein i have an investment outside india the same entity say has invested 10% in some company in india and thereafter it has further 10% are we saying this will be regarded as a breach of the uh, fdi odi structure so this again becomes a pain point and given the time restriction of course i would want more time